If you've ever taken any creative writing lessons or just watch a bunch of videos on YouTube, you've probably heard of the Chekhov's gun principle. It's a dramatic principle that suggests that details within a story or play will contribute to the overall narrative. It plays into the why show it if it's not important and is the basis of 90% of theories that exist in Genshin or actually any medium. Small tidbits of lore can have massive consequences in the future writing of any genre. And today, I'm going to show you one of the many, many possible instances of foreshadowing in Genshin Impact. We always dive into artifact lore for these kinds of things, but it's always important to look at the pivotal characters that make this game and break our wallets. The playable characters' stories are often filled to the brim with great lore hints, and today, I want to give emphasis on a particular group of characters that might just serve a grander purpose in the narrative of Genshin, and that's the Mondstadt playable characters. Mondstadt as a region is actually pretty notorious for having the least bit of lore in the entirety of the game. Despite having its main events, Mondstadt's stories are often character-driven or festive to the point that it explores current Mondstadt rather than older traditions. Unlike Inazuma, Liyue, and Sumeru, Mondstadt's lore is much more barren, all things considered, until you look at the motifs of the nation. Venti and Mondstadt's lore highly reflect the theme of cultivation. Wine is their best known resource. Venti he also has a quote known as the seeds of story brought by the wind and cultivated through time. All in all, Mondstadt's lore is meant to represent slow building blocks that move towards the future endeavors of Genshin rather than pieces of lore that focus on the past. And this is best reflected in the characters, because I theorize that a majority of Mondstadt's character lores are meant to hint at future concepts and themes in other regions. Now, disclaimer, this is all just a theory and honestly, character analyses that came from my other video where I read through the stories of Mondstadt characters for some fun facts. Important note is that this video focuses on the playable characters and their motifs and their importance except for Venti, because Venti's already been dissected enough. This video won't include other lore bits like locations, domains, or references that aren't directly connected to the characters' stories because I want to focus on them being the Chekhov's gun. Albedo and Klee's lore both connect us to really, really distant themes about other worlds and alchemy. They essentially became our peek into the grander concepts of otherworldly exploration, science, and transmutation. The first one is Alice. Klee's story opens us to her connections with Alice and even the Golden Apple Archipelago. Alice is already a massive enough player in the endgame because it connects us to the themes of descenders and otherworldly travel. But it's also massive because Alice seems to play by the same rules as a traveler, in which her memories aren't affected by the Ermin Cell if we dissect the Wanderer trailer. Alice is also a major player when it comes to the strange workings of fate and how she has a responsibility that transcends Teyvatian borders. The second one is Albedo's story setting the precursor for the lore of the Cataclysm. Albedo's story gives us the basic building blocks for understanding what happened in the Cataclysm and what corruption technically is, which is further reflected in the abyssal area of the Chasm. Albedo's story also introduces us to Gold or Rhine Daughter, the alleged culprit behind the Conrian incident who started a war with her strange creations. These creations would soon come to terrorize Mondstadt, Liyue, Sumeru, and Inazuma in the future, in which they all connect back to Albedo's character character stories. Albedo is also one of the characters that has the strongest endgame potential because of how unique his story is compared to everyone else. He's amongst the fewest practitioners of the dead art of Kemia, an art from Conria known to create inorganic life. Albedo's lore also connects us to a mysterious creature known as Nabarius, whose heart was found by both Rhine Daughter and him during an expedition into a domain. It is unknown what Nabarius is, but its name is a demon that comes from the Ars Goetia, the same book where all the other demon gods who participated in the Archon War like Guizhong, Guoba, the Archons, Havria, and many many more come from. And we can also guarantee that this is an important figure because for some reason after finding the heart of Nabarius, Rhine Daughter leaves Albedo in Mondstadt and disappears indefinitely. And let's not forget that one strange line from Albedo's character quest. Next character is Bennett. Nobody has any idea what Bennett's bad luck is, and that's really strange. In a game where fate and consequences are such a big thing, the fact that Bennett has cosmic bad luck is an enigma in and of itself. We already know that in Genshin, things just happen because they have to happen, so fate and circumstance are very powerful concepts that could be tied with Bennett's concept of luck. But if we want more concrete foreshadowings from Bennett's lore, his story talks about a mysterious place with scorching flames, deafening thunders, and hollering winds 
had threatened to rip one's souls from themselves. This was the location where an adventurer found Bennett when Bennett was still a baby. It's unknown what this place is, but it's most likely not the Marijavari, because while the Marijavari is known as a Sea of Ashes, it also doesn't have the wind. So whatever this place is, is most likely a new area that would hopefully get expanded in the future. Or maybe it could be the Marijavari, just told from a more art artistic point of view, which is why they have the hollering winds mentioned. Now for another bold theory, what if this place comes from the northern borders of Mondstadt and Natlin, where Vanessa allegedly comes from? There is no solid proof of this, but there is really no place in Mondstadt that's known for raging fires. Actually, no place in the current Genshin has a place that's filled with fire, so your guess on who or what Bennett is is as good as mine. But nevertheless, Bennett's story opens us to the hint of this mysterious cursed land that's described in his character stories. And if this place really is Natlin, this is one of the fewest hints we have of the Pyro Nation. Or if not, this is also one of the fewest hints we have of the Marijavari. If we want to talk about foreshadowing about the enemies in the game, we should look at Diluc and Kaya. Diluc's story foreshadows the Delusion and the Harbingers, alongside Venti's exposition and the Archon Quest. Diluc's story also foreshadows a strange organization of intel gatherers who used to be esteemed members of society before completely dedicating themselves to the cause. What this intel network does or can do is unknown, and I wonder if such a time would come that we would ever meet other members from this society. Nevertheless, Diluc's story was actually one of the first times that we've ever seen a delusion put to use by someone that's still alive in the game, the other character being Kali. As for Kaya, he gives us insight into the future plans of the surviving Conrians and the mysterious ploy brewing when the time is right. Kaya was sent as an agent of Conry to Mondstadt when he was younger, and what this means for any future implications is still currently unknown. The next one is Thayona. The foreshadowing Diona's story actually already manifested in the game, and that's the story of the Spring Fairy. The tale connected her with the future lore of Endora and the Lock Folk, a story that actually has future repercussions on the important legends revolving around Fontaine. There is a legend about a Spring Fairy that circulates in Diona's hometown. The fairy once saved a mother and son who had despaired beside a well, filling the barren hole with rushing waters that pooled and formed the spring. The child, deathly ill, was miraculously healed by those spring waters. Many people came to catch a glimpse of these blessed waters and built a settlement around it, and left it not thereafter. Over time, this gave rise to the small town known as Springvale. This was the fairy that blessed Deona with her ability to concoct all sorts of fascinating drinks. The truth, however, is that the Spring Fairy is a Lock Folk, which opens us to the story of how the Lock Folk were once loving creatures of the previous Hydro Archon. But after the rule of the God of Justice, some Lock Folk detested the idea of serving her and went on a self imposed exile. Which I'm definitely sure has some grander implications in the future, especially since the Lock Folk are still mourning over the loss of their previous Hydro Archon even to this day. Lisa's story gives us the first core ideas of the Academia's corruption and gluttony for knowledge. Her character's stories became our foreshadowing to the strange machinations of the Academia's rowdy erudites and extensive workloads. Also, Lisa is the first time we've ever seen someone question the visions, setting that idea up for the Inazuma Archon quest. Visions were oftentimes just seen as blessings and powers during this stage of the game, but Lisa's story actively questions if the gods would really quote unquote give something as powerful as a vision for seemingly nothing. The skepticism would eventually flourish into the reality that the Archon Cons aren't the ones that give the visions to the people, and that there are other higher powers that are actually in play. Mona Mona's character story and whole characterization introduces us to the concept of fate and destiny, a theme in Tavat's future Archon quests that would eventually prove to be important since time, memories, and history became all the more relevant. Through Mona's character, we get the constant theme of fate being unchangeable and only accepted, or the constellations playing a massive part in a person's future. Astrology also plays a massive role in other characters that practice the field, such as Layla who also does star readings and star charts. Also, Mona is one of the few playable characters in the lore that have connections with Fontaine. Mona writes astrology columns for the Steambird. It's also unknown where Mona is from since it's not fully confirmed if she's from Fontaine. We first meet her in Liyue, and the house she's staying at in Mondstadt isn't actually her original home. Fischl there are two characters to dissect when talking about Fischl. One is Amy, and one is the princess who allegedly comes from a fictional story. 
Now, one strange coincidence about Amy that could really, really just be an unfortunate coincidence is that Amy, for as mundane as the name sounds, is actually a name from the Ars Goetia, much like Naberius who was previously mentioned. Amy was claimed to teach astronomy and liberal arts, as well as give familiars and reveal treasures. Themes that actually very well reflect Fischl's lore as an investigator in the Adventurers Guild, as well as being one of the only characters to have a true familiar, unlike Xiangling's Guoba and Ito's Ushi who are both separate creatures. Now the book where Princess Fischl came from, The Flowers for Princess Fischl, is a fictional work in the universe of Genshin, since we see an author's note in a Q&A section that blatantly shows the author talking to his fans. But the location known as the Summer Nachtgarten is a strange place in Mondstadt, and we know this because of the domain lore for the Midsummer Courtyard. If you read the book where Fischl's namesake and personality comes from, it also talks a lot about descending from other worlds and grand battles of old. The problem is that the book is inherently fictional, even if we incur the fairy tales or allegories argument. But I can't help but wonder if the author was inspired by actual historical events. Sucrose Sucrose's character story talks about a mysterious domain in Tevat with pretty pink flowers the height of a hundred people, teeny tiny floating fairies flying all over the place, and beautiful unicorns. Now, in the current lore of Genshin, the closest that we have to that are the forests of Sumeru with their giant mushrooms, but not to the same extent. It's also fascinating that we get mentions of unicorns when unicorns aren't actually known to exist in Genshin mythos. The only real piece of information we have about the mythos of unicorns is with Albedo's story, and that's not even confirmed to be the case. The sword, the cinnabar spindle, talks of the one-horned white horse, but never explicitly calls it a unicorn. So we're just going to have to see if this mysterious domain is actually a real place, or if it's just a fairy tale. But that's it for me today. Now, why did I make this video? Well, I made it to show you just how fascinating the character stories are in the grand scheme of Genshin's lore. Especially since when we talk about lore, it's oftentimes the obscure books and artifact sets that get the general attention, but not frequently the role of the characters. But I wanted to make this video to emphasize that character lore can be a very powerful world-building tool. I also wanted to show how strange Mondstadt is from a writing perspective. Compared to other nations, Mondstadt character lore is versatile and hardly restricts itself to just Mondstadt which is pretty neat. But when I think of it from a writing perspective, using characters as Chekhov's guns is a great practice, especially more minor characters that you'd think wouldn't have that big of a role like, say, the Archons or the Harbingers. But nevertheless, my name is Aster and this has been Aster really liking Monset's character stories. Thanks for chilling with me. I pray to God that I pressed record. If you're hearing this, this means that I did, but... Oh boy, I am... S what?